welcome to Resilience in Life and Leadership with your host, Stephanie Olson, speaker, author, addiction, sexual violence, and resiliency expert. All right. I can't even tell you how excited I am to introduce this next guest who I seriously have not walked away with just wisdom before, like, oh my gosh, yes, that is amazing. Yes. This is what I did after this next guest. Sean Tyler Foley is an accomplished film and stage performer and has been acting in film and television since he was six years old. He has appeared in productions including Freddy vs. Jason, which we talk about, Door to Door, which we also talk about, Carrie, and the musical Ragtime. Tyler is passionate about helping others confidently take the stage and impact an audience with their stories. He is currently the managing director of Total Buy-In and author of the number one best-selling book, The Power to Speak Naked. Welcome, Tyler Foley. Well, hello and welcome to, by the way, I'm going to read your bio ahead of time, off, off camera. Well, hello and welcome to Resilience in Life and Leadership. I am so excited to have Tyler Foley here um, on the show. Welcome, Tyler. Hi, Stephanie. I'm I'm looking forward to this. I've had this circled for a while, as you know. I am too. We're going to have a lot of fun. And um, I hear Tyler is absolutely hilarious. So no pressure, no pressure, <laughs> but, but humor is a good thing. So now at the very least, I'm funny in my own mind. Well, and that's all that matters sometimes, actually. I am too. So you are doing a lot of amazing things, but First, I want to hear how this all started and whether that starts with I was born or whatever, but I want to hear how you got where you are today. Oh, they see just asking it like that makes me want to put on the movie film (laughs) boy. Like in a time of dark ages when hippies (laughs) ruled the earth, 1979, (laughs) Tyler Foley brought forth into the planet. Uh, Yeah, no, I. You like that? Thank you. Yeah. I, I work on that. Um, no, I, I was, I, I literally, when I was born, I'm sure I came out of the womb a performer. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, that's in my DNA. Um, I was one of those kids who, when family would come over for, uh, you know, family gatherings, events, like Christmas, Easter, stuff like that. Um, I was always the one who wanted to like put on the show. Like, you know, you drape a, a blanket over the yes. fireplace and it became the stage and you dance. And I remember getting a magic kit when I was like three or four years old and just falling in love with magic and wanting to perform for everybody. Um, that, that was just, that was who I was. And, you know, that probably was very obvious when I first started elementary school and my first grade teacher, Judy Nielsen, um, cast me in a couple of the school plays. So like the Christmas pageant, I got to play Joseph. And then at Easter, uh, we did this, uh, like a Peter Rabbit play and I got to play Peter Rabbit. And I I remember it because I was, I had to be sick and my mom fed me chamomile tea. That was, that was the story. And I couldn't pronounce chamomile. So (laughs) Mrs. Nielsen worked with me for forever to to say chamomile. And now to day because i i have a wicked caffeine intolerance I, if mm. i have uh black tea or green tea people don't realize green tea has caffeine in yes. it if i have a coke oh man <laughs> don't even look at coffee don't, don't come oh, near me wow. if I have, i'm sorry if I, yeah if i have any beverage that has caffeine in it after about 10 o'clock in the morning I will be wide awake staring at the ceiling with my brain going a thousand miles a minute, like a hamster on a wheel uh, until probably 3 a.m. Oh my gosh. So that would I do me in. Yeah. I drink chamomile tea because it's, it's fantastic. And, <laughs> and every time I drink it, I think of Judy Nielsen in the first Aww, grade. It was kind of prophetic. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and uh, so I, w- I took to the stage and I had a real liking to it. Um, and in the first grade, unfortunately, uh, my father passed away in a single vehicle motor vehicle oh, wow. accident. And he, you know, that, that was, he wasn't even 35. I think oh my when gosh. my father passed away, I think he was uh, 33 years old 
at oh, the time. That's tragic. I'm sorry. I was six. My mom was uh, just coming up her 30th birthday. Uh, she mm-hmm. would have just celebrated her 30th and my sister was two and a half. Oh, so, gosh. you know, my poor mom, 30 years old, yeah. full life ahead of her and now a widower, widower with um, two children. And I, you know, I, I have nothing but admiration and, and respect for my mom for all she did and continues to do yeah. for me and my sister. Um, we lacked for nothing wow. growing up which couldn't have been easy because the plan was my dad went to school. And then once he was finished his school and got his education, uh, they were going to work for a little bit. And then mom was going to go back to school and she was literally Mm -hmm. going to go back to school like the next year. But dad had uh, pushed out their plans just a touch because he wanted, he was an educator. He was a teacher in my town, Um, but he had taken a one year sabbatical to start a restaurant. Because he he was very entrepreneurial, loved to cook. My dad made the best French onion soup, and I know oh. that. Uh, and cream of asparagus. I'm a, I'm one of those weird kids. Like I grew up loving asparagus because yeah. my father made this cream of asparagus soup that was just phenomenal. And to this day, you know, I'll go to like some of the finest restaurants in the world. You know, five star Michelin in there, and I'll be like, hey, "Can I try the French onion soup?" And I'm like, mm, "Just not a little compare. salty. Just a little salty." <laughs> <laughs> my, my dad did better. Um, sorry, Wolfgang, but yeah. uh, you're not up to snuff. And uh, try so, harder. Try harder. Yeah, so when my dad passed away, um, I was six, right? So you really have a hard time um, processing the finality yeah. of death, and, and you know, there's a bit of an emotional disconnection. Like you're a growing human being, and your brain hasn't fully developed. Yeah. It, yeah. And it, hard to process a lot of this stuff. Uh, so I didn't really grieve my father's passing. And so I was encouraged to explore my emotions on stage. And I, uh, so many things kind of conspired and fell into place. And I, I ended up acting professionally. Um, my uncle worked uh, for the city um, and uh, right across the from the street from city hall was the fine arts complex newly constructed fine arts complex uh right around the time that uh calgary hosted the olympics there was a lot of infrastructure that yeah. got put into place and the fine arts complex was one of them and so he would it had all the great restaurants and, and my uncle was a perennial bachelor and to this day uh does not cook for himself if food doesn't get ordered and come to him my uncle wouldn't eat uh, so he would go <laughs> To rest, and honestly, skip the dishes has has made my uncle's dietary options so much larger. He's, That's hilarious. He's, loves Ugh. it, um, but he would go to the restaurants to to eat his food. And the casting director for one of the large theater companies in the city um, was complaining about how hard it was. Had, I think her exact words that caught his attention were uh, how hard is it to find a small boy to play Tiny Tim? Like, <laughs> you know, you just need a, literally a small boy. Yeah. And and he kind of, he was, you know, two tables over and did the, I'm sorry to um, have eavesdropped, but like, how small? Like, what are you looking for? And she's like, well, we need somebody who's, you know, like six to nine years old, but looks younger than that and is slight so that they can sit on Bob Cratchit's shoulder. And she, you know, that she knew the breakdown of it. And he was like, well, my nephew's six and he looks like a three-year-old. Does that work? Because <laughs> I'm a tiny kid. So my dad was like, I'm a giant in my family at five, eight. Uh, my dad was oh, five, goodness. five, five, four. My mom is five, two. Um, my sister is like, I think five, 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 six. Wow. But, um, wow. you know, so I, I, and I like my full grown, I ate all my Wheaties, had my spinach, <laughs> you had ate my vegetables. Yes. I had asparagus, yes. you know, slammed my proteins. Um, and uh, I have I have fully developed into my gigantic <laughs> five foot seven, 135 pound frame. So I got to play Tiny Tim. That's and, fabulous. Uh, and from that point on, you know, I was not just in love with, but fully addicted to live theater. Mm. And that has created a 36 year career and hobby that has sustained me. Um, And that, that kind of kicked off 
my life. I went to a fine arts high school, graduated from that, um, ha- just went out to Vancouver, made a, a real go of being a professional actor out there. Very successful at it too. And uh, at 25, I'd been in the industry for 20 years. So I did what anybody with a 20 year career does. And I retired. Yes. Yes. Uh, Cause that's you know, what we that's do what at do. 25. At, well, at 20, 20 years into your career, you do yeah. 25 is just a bonus. Yeah. And uh, I went back to school, got an engineering discipline, started my own company um, uh, doing uh, geomatics, uh, which is a fancy word for earth study. And wow. I specialized in aerial photography and photogrammetry. So if anybody That's who is so ever cool, yeah, anybody who's ever turned on satellite view on Google map, absolutely. Um, that the pictures of the ground. That's what I did. I stitched huh. together pictures of the ground so that you could turn on Google Maps and know where your house was and <laughs> ask awesome. whose car is parked out front. <laughs> right. um, that's that's what I did, and uh, unfortunately, that business collapsed uh, for a couple of reasons. I am I at the time was not a very good business mind. Uh, I didn't know what I didn't know, and I didn't know yeah. a lot. Uh, I had a great mentor who was a brilliant business mind um, and really, really good um, photogrammetrist. She was she was phenomenal. Unfortunately, she passed away very suddenly, mm. and the business collapsed. Wow. Uh, so then I was then I was out to the wind again. But a good friend of mine, uh, who is a, a much smarter businessman and, and mentored me in business quite well, actually, uh, was had a company and they were expanding rapidly. They'd gone from, you know, just a small family operation, four or five employees to 20 employees yeah. and then to 50 employees and then at a hundred employees. And at that point you needed a full-time safety manager. And when you're in geomatics, typically your primary client is the government. And when you work for the government, they always require that you have a safety system in place. Sure. But when I started my company, I needed to get all of the safety training and Matt knew that. So when he, needed a safety manager, he was like, listen, you've got all of this safety training. If you take these three courses and I'll pay for them, you can upgrade your qualifications to a national construction safety officer designation. Mm. And, uh, and I need you to have that for you to come work for me. Would you be interested in coming to work for me? And I was like, "Mm, tell me more. And he had just gotten this huge project, um, helping wire, uh, a multi, multi multi-million dollar uh, like eight figure, nine figure uh, construction build up north doing oil and gas stuff. And, and so I, I was intrigued because it wasn't something hmm. that I'd ever done. Right. I am obviously not built for a laborer. So the likelihood that I was going to be in oil and gas in any capacity other than some form of management role was slim to none. And I didn't study <laughs> that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. to, to have the opportunity to go up and do that and make some really good money really fast uh, was intriguing. So I did that. And, um, while I was up there, the guys really didn't respect, <laughs> respect me at first because <laughs> I'm not a laborer. I'm not an electrician. Definitely what are you doing not here? What are you doing exactly. here? Yeah. And why are you telling me? And yeah, thanks safety guy. Yeah. You've chewed through five of you already, and <laughs> you are definitely not going to last, but I'm, I'm, if nothing, I'm two things, stubborn and creative. And I refuse to let those guys push me around metaphorically or physically. And I was hell bent on finding solutions. And um, one day, a couple of uh, executives were touring the building uh, on a quarterly thing. And so they were big wigs for, you know, multi-billion dollar corporations. And I, as a safety manager, want to make sure that everything good at least with my guys right. i didn't control the entire site but i can i could you know oversee my guys and they were not working safely they were mm-hmm. working at height not tied off um oh, because it was um multinational company we were following osha rules and not our ohs rules and osha rules were most more stringent so they needed to be tied off at six feet um and they were well above six feet and they didn't have anything close to any kind of fall arrest um on and they were like leaning over ladders. And so I yelled at them. And uh, in my rant, I said, you know, they were like, because they were pushing back. You've never even been, you don't even know. You don't know it's actually more unsafe for you to do that like that. 
you know, if I was to do all the things that you want me to do, production would never happen and blah, 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 blah. And they were telling me how it was more unsafe for me, for them to do the work yeah. the way that I wanted them to do it. And I said, let me tell you a little something. When I was 19 in Vancouver, I was a stunt man jumping out of six story windows and jumping out of a six story wow. window was safer than what you're doing right now. Wow. Well, the executives were standing behind me when they heard me yelling <laughs> and I didn't realize that. And the one guy pulled me aside and he said, is that true? I said, is what true? He's like, were you really a stunt man? I was like, oh, well, I was an actor who did stunts. Yes, I was blessed yeah. to work around some really good stunt professionals. And yes, I had done a couple of high falls. And he said, do you really think that was safer than what these guys are doing? I said, oh, hands down. And I, I went into a little bit of an explanation of all the things that went into one stunt that is three seconds long on film and yet is three months in planning at wow. least. Um, and all of the rehearsal and training and, and equipment that goes into making that yeah. one thing happen and nobody even knows you did it. Yeah. And, uh, and he's like, would you mind giving that as part of the toolbox talk tomorrow morning? And a toolbox talk is just the morning safety meeting. I said, sure. And so I did it. And all of these executives were still on site doing their quarterly inspection thing. So there was probably four or five really, really big companies rep represented there. And they heard me give this talk. And another one came in and was like, that's fascinating. Would hmm. you come and give that as a keynote presentation at our next safety stand down? Wow. I was like, sure. What's a keynote? <laughs> Because I, I didn't know, right? And he explained it to me. And I was like, sure. And then he was like, okay, my, my EA will be in touch with you. And he goes, how much would you charge for it? And I didn't know. I didn't yeah. know what, what it was. And I, so I, I was totally joking, totally joking. I threw out my monthly salary. I was like, I don't know, maybe this much? And he was like, okay, we'll have the paperwork drafted up. And he walked away. Didn't even wow. blink at it. I was making oil and gas money. I gave him a month's salary Jeez. and he said, yes. And all of a sudden I went, why the hell am I spelling, spending three weeks away from my newly married wife um, to be up in the middle of nowhere, freezing yeah. cold with guys who don't respect me <laughs> if I can make a month's salary talking like. Uh, for an hour, <laughs> probably, it, right? For 45 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Not even an hour. And that's with the Q&A. So I, uh, I, I rapidly realized that that was a, a career that I wanted to pursue. That's awesome. And for the last probably seven years, it's all I've done. And in addition to that, I've, I've created a wonderful safety consulting company where we train executives on giving better presentations. It started with safety presentations. Yeah. Like how do you just make toolbox talks more interesting? But I realized there was a larger audience that just needed to learn how to present better. And so between my keynote speaking and the consulting and coaching, I, I'm living probably the best life I ever could. That's awesome. and, and I still get to embrace the performer inside of me. Right. But but now I have the freedom of saying my own words instead of um, somebody else's. Yeah. And I love every minute of it. That is fantastic. Okay. So you and I have a lot in common because um, I love asparagus, but also when I was a little girl, so I'm older than you by probably 10 years. <laughs> a couple <of> years. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Years. That's right. Yep. And Greece was the big movie when I was oh. like six years old. And so we would put on Grease, the entire musical for my parents who were probably cringing because we had no idea what we were saying in half of those songs. <laughs> Summer Nights was just- Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh. but, but we did it well. And, um, and so I love that. And um, today I'm a speaker and a, um, and then I do acting on the side, never did any stunts, not a stunt. Yeah. Nope. Can't do that. But I love that because you have now an opportunity to really help other speakers and really get them into their own. Um, tell me about that because the book, I love the title <laughs> of your book, the power to speak naked. <laughs> speak naked. Yeah. That's fabulous. Uh, oh, I love it too. Just a uh, complete aside, just because I, uh, 
you're a fan of Greece and I'm a fan of Greece and I absolutely love Greece. Uh, one of the uh, films that I got to work on in Vancouver was a movie called Jack. And uh, it starred An the late great Anton Yelchin uh, when he was still young. And because he was not yet 16 um, and the, in the movie he had to drive, the character had oh. to drive. And his mom was played by Stalker Channing. Oh, I and love I her. love Rizzo. Right? Oh like, my like, gosh. Rizzo! And uh, so for, I was um, Anton's stand-in and photo double for the whole show. And so I, all of these driving scenes, I got to drive the vehicle, uh, an old uh. Volvo station wagon. And I got to drive, I literally got to chauffeur Stalker Channing around okay. Vancouver. Super jealous right truck. now. Super oh. jealous. Oh my gosh. That is one of my, my, and it's funny because it's not something that I was performing in, right? It was just one of those jobs in between acting gigs, as you and I both oh. know, that you just kind of do. Yeah. And, and I loved doing the, the stand-in work. Like that was just fun because you got to work with the camera crew and you got to work with the AD and the director of yeah. photography. And, and that was just that, that side of, of the business always fascinated me. And those guys work so hard. And um, so to get to not only be doing that, and the other thing is too, it's, it's a better paycheck, right? Because you're on the, for most actors, especially for me, I'm a day player. So I'm going to show up for a day, right. make, make a thousand bucks tops and then go away where when you're a stand in yeah you're making a little bit lower wage but you're probably pulling two to three hundred dollars a day that's awesome over six seven weeks like it was a it was a great way to go so i got to work that with, is uh, so cool dr channing and yeah i'm and just a community theater gal i've never yeah that's awesome I, 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 community theater is some of the best like that's that's it's, important that's it's that, a blast that's bringing arts to the yeah. to the people who truly truly want it and and need it so that's i true. just finished a, a community production of music man and <sighs> uh in a small town about an hour south of me the good friend of mine was the director of it and uh, the guy that was playing mayor shin dropped out of the play oh. four weeks before they went up Yikes. in his community theater so they only rehearse once a week, yeah. which meant they only had three rehearsals. Oh my gosh. Before the oh my show gosh. went up. Because oh. and it was over Christmas too. So uh so she phoned me in a panic and she's like, How fast do you think you can memorize shin? <laughs> like, I can handle that. That's yeah, that's not too bad. Don't make that's me awesome. Professor Harold Hill and I'll be good. Uh so I did that. I love community. Oh, but that's fun. Let's start answering your real we question. We digress. Of my digression. Um, so as far as the book goes. Uh, the power to speak naked has been uh, a joy for me. And uh, yeah, what do you want to know about it? And I'll, I'll answer all the questions. Well, so I love the idea because I think that, I mean, speaking is supposedly the number two fear after death. Is that right? Uh, no, no, no. It's ahead is of it, death. It's, it's, it is the number two fear, but okay. it's ahead of death. Death is number three. Number one is actually uh, fear of heights. Oh my gosh, which fear I have- Fear of heights slash fear of falling. I do have a fear of heights, but um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think about all of these people and today times have changed so much that we're almost constantly in presentation mode. I mean, as, as a society and, and in work. And so getting people to overcome some of those, those things, um, and we always say, you know, picture the audience naked. Oh, but yeah, yeah. Worst advice ever. Yeah. Worst advice ever. It actually, so okay, I'm about to go on a rant. Go. And so before I go on the rant, let's prep this rant. Because when I was trying to brainstorm the title for the book, uh, we, I was stuck with, with a title. All the time. Uh, originally, so how the book came to be, I had been doing the keynote presentations for a few years okay. and had a whole training seminar around public speaking. And um, the title of it, I can't even remember what the, what we used to call the program. It was something like um, uh, leadership 
presentations or something like that. Like something generic. Something very and just creative. Yeah. So boring. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that was going to be that was the working title of the book and it just it just sucked and i had been asked to present um at a conference and it, it was for um a company that that promoted using self published books uh to uh to promote businesses and and they asked me to come up and and do a bit of a presentation on you know how you can use the book to find speaking engagements and and how to be more effective when you're presenting and so i was i was sitting around at the end of the conference and it was like a saturday night and i my publisher i needed to have the title into the publisher by monday because they needed to start working on the cover art okay and without a title you can't come up with cover art and we needed to find the direction for it and all of the rest of that and so I was asking, you know, it was a book on advice and, and we'd basically taken my seminar and transcribed it and taken what is two and a half days. So, you know, we're talking uh, 14 and 14 hours, 28 hours, and then another six hours, like over 30 hours of yeah. information and compress it into 10 chapters, which according to my publisher has a read time of 114 minutes. <laughs> so you know, we've, we've taken over 30 hours of information and compressed it into two hours to give advice and make it a little bit of an easy read. And so I was asking them, you know, what, what is some advice that you've gotten? Like what, like maybe we just make up one of the like snippets or soundbite from the book, the title, like, and so we were just trying to brainstorm and my uh, ghostwriter was there with me an editor. And she had said exactly that picture your audience naked. And I went, Oh my God, that is the, <laughs> the worst advice that you could ever give somebody because I, I don't know where it started. I don't even think it's really a thing. I don't think it works. If you, what, what's the That's idea? Just weird. You're it's just weird. Gaining, you're, you're gaining comfort from somebody else's discomfort yeah. or you're picturing somebody else in discomfort to try and gain power. Either way, that's masochistic. Really, you should be in service to your audience. You need to hold them in regard and, and revere them, not yeah. del diminish them or belittle them and so why 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 like yeah. it's just the worst advice ever and i finished the rant by saying i would rather give somebody the power to speak naked on stage than to be picturing their audience naked and as soon as i said it everybody went oh <laughs> oh now that's a title and as we started to unpack it the more and more i fell in love with it yeah because on its surface i mean that like i want somebody to be so confident in their yeah. messaging so absolutely mesmerized me with their delivery that they didn't care what they were wearing that right. they could you know be putting on a production of hair and wearing the emperor's new clothes yep. and be completely totally comfortable and not care yeah that's true self mastery of your own body. That is true right. confidence. So I genuinely on the surface want somebody to have the power to speak naked. I also want them to have the ability to be so engaging mm -hmm. to their audience and be so compelling with their craft and with their story that they're telling that even if they were naked, the audience wouldn't even notice. Yep because they wouldn't be paying attention to what they were wearing because it would be irrelevant yep. because what they were saying was what was really important. And then a sub level to that is because I feel that you should be engaging on your own. I want you to be able to give a raw naked presentation, not necessarily from a clothing perspective, but you don't need the PowerPoint. Yeah. In fact, please don't use a PowerPoint. Um, you don't need audio. You don't need AV. You don't need lights. You don't need props. You don't need handouts. You should be able to give somebody information one-on-one. Yes. -on -one. Um, we have been communicating as a species for millennia Yes. orally. And I think a lot of people forget that our current level of literacy and especially our current level of information availability is is very new yeah you only have to go back 150 200 years and you don't have this level of literacy that's right where people couldn't read but everybody could speak 
you know, you can, you can hear, you can understand, and this is how we have communicated. And I promise you, you know, Plato's and Socrates did not have a PowerPoint. They used Keynote, right? Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah, they were using Keynote. They were, because they're obviously, they're Apple products because right. they're green. Exactly. Yes. You know, and, and that yeah. has always been my, my big push against right. the big AV. That and most people use it wrong because PowerPoint becomes a, an aid and a it, prompt to oh. read text. Okay. I am so in love with what you're saying right now and, um, and super inspired actually, because, um, I think that one of the worst things that people can do, and I'm not going to call out any, um, any thing, but, you know, they go to these meetings to learn how to present and it's, well, no, you need to walk to the side three times and you need to say this and don't do this. Just be authentic, just be yourself. And that's what it is all about. Yeah. And, and here's the thing. I, I love the sentiment. I hate the word. Authenticity is probably the most overused well, and misunderstood word in right. the industry right now. And, but you were right. It's the be yourself. So for me, authenticity is synonymous with self-awareness. Mm, okay. A lot of people think that their authentic self, like I grew up in rural Alberta. I'm basically Texas North. Okay. Uh, and <laughs> I, I grew up around a lot of ranch hands yep. and a lot of farmers and a lot of truckers. Um, so, you know, we're just, truckers are just inland sailors. Yeah. And they yep. swear like that. Yeah. So I have a very colorful vocabulary. Yes. When I'm not paying attention. <laughs> Be, just because I swear often does not mean that when I'm not swearing, I'm not being authentic. Mm. And a lot of people okay, think that, I love this, what you're saying. that yeah. this word authenticity means that they just get to break out whatever behaviors make them feel comfortable. In my own house, I am a nudist. I am okay. not a fan of clothing. I like to walk around naked. Okay. <laughs> that is my authentic self. So my authentic self is going to walk around naked and swear a lot. But that is that doesn't mean that I get to do that on stage or claim that um, I'm being inauthentic or that my authentic self needs to do this. So you just need to put up with me being naked and swearing. No, this I can so still, good. this is an authentic, genuine conversation. Yeah, I'm yeah. just, you know, adhering to some social norms and being polite. Yeah. Although I suppose if you were naked right now, I wouldn't know if you were, you know. If you, I, bottom down, you're never going to know Right, it. exactly. No. <laughs> but, but what you're but saying I have is the decency, right. Yeah, and I have the decency for your visual audience yes. who is going to see this to, you know, at least put something on the top and, and present you. myself well. But the simple fact of the matter is, is that I am very aware of who I am. Mm. I had, there is no mistake. And when I come for who you get right now, this conversation that you yeah. and I are having virtually, if I was to come and hang out with you in your home, Stephanie, and a yeah. very lovely home you have. Uh, thank you. You're going to get the same person. Right. There is no difference from here to there. My wife would argue slightly because when I'm on stage and I'm introduced as Sean Tyler Foley, the author mm -hmm. of The Power to Speak Naked, which is my professional stage name and is actually technically my legal name. Um, I am a, Sean Tyler Foley is a, is an, a little bit amplified version of me. Sure. Sure. It's still an authentic version. It's the same way that this is an authentic version of me, even though I'm not naked or swearing. Right. Sean Tyler Foley is the kind of the best of Tyler, you know, a, a little right. bit larger, a little bit more. Cause I'm on stage. I need right. to be right. right. Uh, a little bit more louder, yep. a little bit more animated. Um, but he's still me. My wife will say that she knows when Sean Tyler shows up. <laughs> my voice. And I don't, I don't disagree, mm -hmm. but it's still, still an authentic version of me. Right. Because right. I am very aware of who I am. I know what my messaging is to my core and I'm unapologetic about the things that I say. Uh, but I'm yeah. still 
conscious of the fact that what I'm saying and how I'm saying it needs to be of service to the audience. The audience isn't there to cater to me. I am there to cater to my audience. And therefore, if I have to censor my language and my clothing, or lack thereof, well, guess what? That's what I have to do. I can still do it and still be authentic to me. Because if I'm going to put on clothes, I'm going to put on some fine clothes. (laughs) I'm going to wear a three-piece suit. Even though the rest of the industry is turning away from it and all of the mm-hmm. big names have gone to, you know, a button up shirt, but no tie, probably jeans. Mo- the really, the big guy of the industry is currently wearing his own branded golf shirts and jeans. Mm. And that's fine. That works. Yep. Yep. Probably man is a huge powerhouse and sweats through them like it's going out of style. So it allows him to change in and out of his clothes backstage three or four times over the course of the day when he's presenting. Um, and, but for me, I love to get dressed up. Yeah. You know, I remember the first time I got to go to a gala when I was like 14 years old and got to wear a tuxedo and that I was in love with that from then on in, that's all I wanted to do was, go to galas, wear tuxedos, drink champagne, and eat chocolate dipped strawberries. That's fabulous. So why not? Yeah. And that, right? And so if I'm going to go out on, if I got to put clothes on, I'm going to put on nice clothes. I'm going to put on a tailored suit because again, we guy, Yeah. I'm tiny, 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 off the rack, doesn't work for me. It's not because I'm snotty. It's because I look Mm -hmm. dumpy. So (laughs) give me my tailored clothes. It's going to cost me that anyways. uh, Right, you might as well. I might as well, because if I buy off the rack, I'm going to have to pay a tailor another two to three hundred dollars to make it fit me anyway. So I might as well just get the cloth and the material and the print that I like. That's so right. That's what I do. So it, uh, this, yeah, this authenticity is synonymous with self awareness, and I can't I stress that. it enough. You need to know who you are at your core to be able to then present yourself and be effective to your audience. Remember, you're there for your audience. The audience isn't there for you. That is hands down the best thing I've heard all month. I'm not kidding you that I love how you put that because that I heard somebody say the other day, I was told not to change. I'm perfect just the way I am. And I, and I, well, first of all, yeah, right there. But what you're saying is, is so right on because we're the same person. Well, we should be the same person here, there, and everywhere but we have to present ourselves differently in, in different places we go because, so this afternoon I'm speaking to a group of seventh graders. So I'm going to speak to them very differently than I would speak to a group of women, for example. I mean, yeah. I, in the next uh, three months, I'm going to be speaking at my daughter's elementary school. She is in first grade. I'm going to be officiating a wedding at a swingers resort in Cancun. Wow. Okay. I'm going to be speaking at a safe. Process that for a second. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Process it for a second. I'm going to be speaking at a safety conference as their keynote presenter to close the event. And I will be doing my own two and a half day workshop seminar in Las Vegas. Wow. Wow. I am going to still be me. Yeah. Tyler Foley at all of those events. And I am going to be genuine and authentic at all of those events. I love that. But the way I show up Mm -hmm. will be drastically different at all four because I am in service to my audience. Yeah. The language that I use, the clothing that I wear will be different at all of those events. Wow. Because I need to be of service to my audience and I need to be aware of that. And yes, you can ask about the swinger wedding. Yeah, I don't even know what that means. I mean, I know what swingers are. I know what a wedding is. I'm, yeah. yeah. Uh, Some good friends of mine are, uh, have a very open uh, relationship and, and have had an alternate view on monogamy uh, for their, the existence of their uh, relationship. And they have decided that they do want to officially be wed together. Um, uh, but it's funny because their um, 
they're very, very, very non-traditional. And uh, when they go to Mexico, they like to go to, you know, an adults only Swingers lifestyle resort, yeah. friendly resort. Lifestyle and, friendly. And because the of the nature of the resort, they actually don't have like almost every resort in Cancun, if you said, I want to do a wedding, they're like, okay, we have our designated wedding yes, coordinator, yes. <laughs> our flower girls, we have a pavilion. Do you, what colors do you want? We have ribbons. We could, do you want backings on your chairs? What do you want? How does it go? <laughs> this resort was like, uh, no, senora, we do not. <laughs> and, and so I, my friends were, were like, listen, we can't get an efficient um, we think you'd be fantastic if we if we paid for your flight and hotel. Would you come down and marry us? I'm like, well, I can't marry you legally. They're like, oh, don't worry about it. It's just for show. We just need some pictures. Oh, um, but we we're gonna get married, you know, the week before. Uh, we're gonna have a justice of the peace come to the house. Small, small, small gathering with like six of our family there. Uh, just so that they can witness the right, union. Right. And then we're going to have all of our friends who know what the deal is uh, come down. And we're just going to have a big party, but we need, you know, we need the good pictures. We need the look. Picture. Right. Yeah. And they're like, you're funny, you're good looking, and you can <laughs> talk. So you'll do dance, puppet dance i love and, that that's hilarious yeah so i'm i'm literally they're going to be there for like a week or 10 days and it's a big party i'm literally flying down the day before the wedding standing up doing the best elvis and per elvis wedding nice. uh wedding version without the rhinestones uh because huh. it's literally like the bride wants a do you take <laughs> to be all right. So who wants to say some vows? No vows? Okay, let's do this thing. Because they literally just want to see some animation from me oh so that gosh. they can get the pictures. It's just a photo op. That is um, hilarious. Okay. Yeah. So again, for to, that particular yeah. speaking engagement, I will be changing up my wording. And Different my than the first grade presentation. Different. Just <laughs> drastically just a different. little. <laughs> And, but to be honest, if I was between Mexico and my daughter's school, I think I'm most looking forward to my daughter's school. Yeah, I know. Oh, there's yeah. nothing, there's nothing like those, those first graders, they're the best and you can't screw up. Well, no, you can't screw up. And here's the thing, the school that my daughter goes to, one of the reasons we chose it is, um, it recognizes public speaking as one of the most important leadership skills that can be developed. Very and smart. this, this school is very future forward um, thinking about prepping its students. And it goes yeah. from K to 12. Oh, I love that. So you're getting the full school, um, very, very small classes, but they encourage public speaking. So um, they asked if I could amend one of my presentations and come and work with the uh, first to third grades for uh, an education piece. Oh, that's fabulous. Part, they, it, every Friday they have, uh, uh, I can't remember what they call it, but they, the students basically get to pick an interest that, that they like from what they've learned through the curriculum over the week. Mm -hmm. And they get an hour to focus on just that one thing. So if you really enjoyed exploring art, you get to go and you get to paint or do whatever medium you were. If you really enjoyed doing the music, you get to go and sing or compose. Mm. If you really enjoyed the math or uh, you get to go and work on math, if you really enjoyed the robotics because, you know, all schools have robotics. They do. This one does. And if you enjoyed the robotics, <laughs> you get to work on the robotics. <laughs> enjoyed the public speaking. And so a lot of the kids, um, they have to present every quarter Love that. to the teachers had their impression of their education. So they basically grade the teachers. The teachers uh, get a report card from the students on how they're doing. And each student has to come up and present, um, you know, a couple of, uh, of how they felt about that. And then they present, and then they present to the parents. So the parents have to be involved too. So we get on a zoom call and then the, they um, say what some of the challenges were 
being supported at home and what some of the triumphs were being supported mm. at home and how we can help them with their education and what 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 they're struggling with and what they need help with. It's just a fantastic wow. thing that they have to do this public speaking. But the kids who really enjoyed it, they're they now get to work with me for an hour on how to be better presenters. That just, is so uh, fun. So I'm just I'm so looking forward to it. Like and because the other thing is too, they're sponges. Yeah. That's, my biggest yeah. problem working with my adult clients, particularly because the majority of my clients are CEOs who are making, you know, a high six, usually seven mm-hmm. figures, and they know everything. Right, right. And so I have to break down years of habits, including the I'm afraid of public speaking. Right. No, you're not. Nobody's actually afraid of public speaking. If people were genuinely afraid of public speaking, commerce would collapse. You'd never be able to go to a restaurant. You mm-hmm. wouldn't be able to order food, yep. right? Like you just couldn't do it you couldn't speak. Uh, because you have to speak in public to a stranger and ask for something that you want. And if you are able to do all those things, you're not afraid of speaking in public. Yeah. What you are afraid of is if the public is listening to you. And so you're actually afraid of public judgment. Yes. And that's what I, that's what I have to work on with all mm-hmm. of these CEOs who feel they need to show up polished, right? Yes. And again, they're yes. taking away from this authentic version of themselves. Yeah. They're afraid. And so the, the, the deepest subtext to my book, The Power to Speak Naked, what I want to empower people to do is to be able to speak the raw naked truth. Mm-hmm. Because often the thing you're afraid to say is what your audience needs to hear. Right. Absolutely. And for these, particularly um, when executives get to a certain point, there needs to be a, a fearlessness and a decisiveness in their direction. And even though inside they're like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing, I don't know what I'm doing. They have to be composed. Yeah. And I've challenged more than one to be like, what happens if you say, I don't know? Yeah. What if you tell the people that you're leading that you're unsure yeah. of this decision, but yeah. the, this is your rationale for making it? Right. Why can't you share your thought process? Right. Why can't you tell them this is something that terrifies me, but I think the risk is worth it? Yes. How much you're going to have people buy into your message if you're honest like that, as opposed to, nope, this is the way. Because if you are thinking, "Mm, yeah, but wait a second, what about? Somebody else was able to figure that out too. That's right. And if you don't address the elephant in the room, if you don't call it out, you don't control the narrative. And part of the advantage of saying the thing that you're afraid to say is you get to be on top of it. You get to control the narrative. You yes. get story and rationale around it so that even though people may be questioning it, they're getting your version. Yeah, yeah. I love, okay. So I, I want this conversation to go on for another five hours. Um, so I am going to have to have you back. On Arts two through five. I'm looking forward yes, to it. Yes, I'm just, I've had so much fun and I, I truly have learned so much from your perspective and what you're talking about. And um, it's you, you are wise beyond your years. <laughs> 36 years on stage. I better know a thing or two about this particular thing. Don't ask me about quantum mechanics. Don't yeah. Mike, don't ask me about most things in life. Parenting. I'm still new to this. Oh. thing. I, it's an experiment. Well, so. I'm not new to parenting. Still can't tell you anything. So that that you'll never you'll never get that. I'm just going to say go on the record. But this I mean what you're talking about is is so it's so simple. But I think it's so hard for people to do sometimes. It's hard to comprehend, it's hard for them to do because it's just it's being you. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. And a lot of times that is the hardest thing to do is yeah. just be you. Yeah. Um, and the great thing is, is when you are you, um, you know, you will, it's like a magnet. You're, you're polarizing at that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. And the people who are positively attracted to you will come into your sphere. And the great thing is, is the people who aren't will walk away from it and completely totally reject and that's okay and that's okay right and that it's in fact easier on you because then you're not trying to cater to somebody who really doesn't want to hear your message anyway exactly um 
And if anybody wants an unbelievable example of this, and I, I don't care what your political affiliation is, I'm not even going to say a name. I'm going to say <laughs> four words, four words, and whoever's listening will have a reaction to it. Everybody has a reaction to this. I don't know if it's a positive reaction or negative reaction, but you will react to these four words. Make America great again. I don't ever have to say who said it or why they said it, but you know exactly who said it. You know exactly how polarizing it is. You know how rabid their following is and how incredibly anti their anti-following yes. is. Yes. But that is somebody who unapologetically is who they are. <laughs> yeah. And will say really, literally, whatever comes to their mm -hmm. mind in the manner in which they choose to do it. That is somebody uh, without a doubt who is self-aware. Now, some would argue they're also very narcissistic and self-centered mm -hmm. and delusional in some ways, mm -hmm. but it's still being authentic. There, there is no mistaking yeah. or hiding uh, who that person is. And that's somebody who is in touch with them. So I'm, you know, wow. use your powers for good instead of evil. Yes. But, but use your powers. Know who, use your powers. Know who you are and be unapologetic about it. And you'd, you'd be in, amazed at how quickly you find your following. And that's, that's really the most important thing. I am so inspired right now. I really am. I feel like I just had a, a lesson um, from you. So I'm, I, am, I am thrilled. Now I have two, two more questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Two questions. I have to ask about Freddy versus Jason. Of course you do. Everybody does. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like to know? So tell me what you did and how was it? It was fantastic. And I did a thing that you can barely see on film. So I played a uh, camp counselor. Okay. I can't remember if my, if my counselor was numbered because I know there was two of us. So I don't know if I'm credited as counselor or counselor number two or camp counselor. I'd have to check up my IMDb, but okay. um, I, what I did was in the final like 10 minutes of the show, the lead Eric, or the lead actress and character um, needs to go into Jason's dream to combat Freddie, who is, you know, because Freddie gets into people's dreams and tries to yeah, kill him. And they, yeah. for some reason, they need Jason to defeat Freddie, or I can't remember what the, how that final plot twist was, but uh, Jason is dreaming in Crystal Lake and the camp council, the kids are, are teasing him and push him into the lake. And that's how Jason drowns and becomes Jason. And he's having a nightmare about this. And so the lead actress is trying to get the attention of the camp counselors. And so she goes up to the camp counselors and says, aren't you going to help? And the camp counselors are um, physically amorous together. <laughs> and, and so I am the, the male camp counselor. And I turn to the lead actress and I say, can't you see I'm busy? And then she says, um, well, aren't you coming? And then I turn around again, but this time I morph into Freddy Krueger. And cool. Freddy goes, uh, I'm trying to, but this is dead on her feet. <laughs> and then the, 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 who was a normal human flesh anime live camp counselor has now become a corpse. And, oh. and then he like waves, Freddie waves the hand like this and the lead actress, ah, and she runs away and he laughs as Freddy Krueger laughs. Um, so yeah, I got to okay. meet Robert Eglund wow. and uh, had a wonderful time on that set. Uh, it's a blip. You literally need to pause the recording to be able to see me in it, but it's it's super fun. Well, and I'm going uh, to do that. Yeah, yeah, that's just really cool. That's that's a cool credit. I like that. Yeah, I it's 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 definitely the one that stands out, which is by the way, a blessing and a curse yeah, because sure. of all the things, like even the fact that when you um, call up my IMDb, it it is the first thing that comes up. 
then Jeremiah, which was a fantastic TV series to be on. Mm -hmm. Then C. Jane Run. C. Jane Run was a student film. So how it's known for and how I get that is one of my main credits. Oh, I'll funny. never know. And then True Calling, same thing. I was a blip. I was, I, I was a glorified extra in it. The only reason I got paid as an actor and credited as an actor is because if you are a background performer, but you're the only background performer with principal performers with lines and you're deemed integral to the scene. Yeah. You have to be paid as an actor under union rules. I was literally a chauffeur. Same thing with Stalker Channing, <laughs> right? I was literally a chauffeur, but I wasn't a photo double because you had to, they, you had to see me. Right. I was a boyfriend who was dropping off the girlfriend who then got murdered by a serial mm -hmm. killer. And then True had to go and investigate it. Uh, and that True was played by Elijah Dushku, who is fantastic and, and a truly underrated uh, performer. And, and she's incredible. But um, yeah, so it was just a blip. And uh, Freddy versus Jason, I just looked it up, by the way, male counselor. Uh, oh, but good. so everybody, everybody sees that first. And the shame of it is that Door to Door is probably the best movie that i was ever in it's a, a made for tv movie stars dame helen murin and um william h macy and they mm. they're phenomenal in it helen murin won a golden globe oh, for it wow when she won her golden globe the scene that they aired to like you know when they show this is the work that you've done yeah the scene that they played was the scene between me her and bill <gasps> how cool is that that is cool and, and so door to door is phenomenal. And everybody's like, so you were in Freddy versus Jason. I'm like, yes, yes, I was. Okay. Let me, but, let me backtrack just a second. So you yeah. went door to door. Yeah. Tell me about that. Tell me about door to door. <laughs> it was a fantastic show stars William H. Macy, uh, Kira Sedgwick. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Kathy Baker was in it too. She had a great, great little role in it. Just a heart wrenching uh, role. And there, it was, it was just a phenomenal, and it's, it's, it's based on a real life story about Bill Porter, who was um, one of the top salesmen for the Watkins company and did door to door sales, despite the fact that he had cerebral palsy and was consistently one of their top salesmen for decades. He was also wow. one of the first people to pioneer online commerce to hmm. save him from having to walk so that he could continue to sell wow. door to door without um, having to actually physically do it because it was becoming hard for him. So wow. like that. Yes, I was in door to door. Thank it. you, Stephanie, yes. for asking. I'm glad you brought it up. Absolutely. No, I that is that is very, very cool. And um, yeah, obviously it's all the, the same thing with anything. Anything that's all hyped is gonna be hype, you know. But the stuff that that we do that sometimes really makes a difference is that's the important stuff, but it's all understated sometimes. So, Sometimes. yeah. Well, okay. Final question. Um, what does resilience mean to you? I think for me, resilience is always finding a way to have forward momentum. Mm, I like that. Because things will always push you back. You are, there is always going to be adversity in life. In fact, life needs adversity. You have to have it. And I always think of that analogy of a bow and arrow, mm. right? You, in order for an arrow to have momentum, it needs to be drawn back first. And the further back you draw it, the more tension in the string, the, the faster that arrow and the straighter that arrow will fly. Yeah. So when you feel everything pushing against you, your job is to find the way to get the forward momentum. Cause as soon as that momentum happens, it will release, it will trigger forward. And recognizing that um, what you feel is pulling you back may actually be the direction you need to travel. Wow. So for me, I think of like a river course, right? I'm Canadian. So mm -hmm. most of the country was explored discovered and founded based on using river courses to traverse this nation, and it's vast it's a vast nation yeah and 
depending on where you were in the country and which direction, when people were first trying to explore this, the majority of our rivers flow west to east. But all of the explorers were coming from Europe. So they were coming from the east and traveling west. When they first navigated these waterways, they were pushing up current. And it was probably 10 times the effort to get up current to find resources. But where did the resources need to go? They needed to go back to Europe. So as soon as they let the paddle go and let the boat float, all of a sudden they're headed back to where they needed to be. Hmm. And sometimes when you feel this adversity, when you feel things are so it's keeping me from my dream. Well, maybe that's your dream, but maybe that's not the plan. Mm. And maybe you're fighting a current that doesn't need to be fought. And, and I have found some of the, my biggest successes have come when I have stopped fighting. Yeah. And I've let myself go. I've let gravity take hold. Yeah. And when I've done that, it's amazing how the compass resets. Mm. Because now you know where true north is. That's right. Instead of trying to forge and, and readjust the compass and be like, no, I want to go to magnetic north. Right, right. Maybe you, maybe you need true north. Mm. So you need to just stop. Yeah. You need to stop and let yourself reset. If it's the river, you need to close your eyes, stop paddling, and just see where this flow of energy is taking you. Mm -hmm. Because it's there for a reason. And resilience is understanding that reason and finding forward momentum. And your forward momentum may not be in the direction that you were initially traveling. Oh, this, that is good. I, I just, I've had um, just all of these moments listening to you and I, I just have loved it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being yeah, we, a part of this show. Um, I've just, I've had a blast talking to you. Well, thank you for having me on, Stephanie. I look forward to parts two through five. You are on. We are going to do that. And uh, we're just going to keep talking because you are a rock star. Seriously. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. And thank you for listening to Resilience in Life and Leadership. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening. Please share with anyone you think will benefit from this podcast.